Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Midweek Mentor. My name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. As always, as you're watching this, this is live, so be sure to drop a comment and, and like this video wherever you're watching it from and share it if you would so that many people can can get this message. We read every comment, we see every like, and we always really appreciate seeing that and being able to engage with you that way. This week we're doing something a little bit different in, in heart of and in spirit of the series that we're doing on Sundays called The Blessed Life. I thought it would be really fun to show you one of my favorite messages from the original series recorded in 2015 at Gateway Church by Pastor Jimmy Evans. Now the author of the book is Robert Morris, of course, but the person who concluded the series for them um, is like a co-leader there, and his name is Jimmy Evans. He uh, has a marriage and family ministry that you may or may not have heard of. You'll meet him in a moment. Um, and I didn't, I don't have the money to bring him in to be a guest speaker right now, but I do have the ability to share one of my favorite messages from this whole entire series, and it's called Dream Givers. And it's all about exchanging our dream for God's dream. A lot of people don't know that God has a dream, but sometimes our dream, our selfish dream, gets in the way of God's unselfish dream and His dream for our life. But I don't need to preach it because Pastor Jimmy Evans is going to explain all of that in just a moment. And I really hope you enjoy this. Over the last five years, I've, I must have watched this message a dozen times and I just got done watching it again uh, for you and just to see it again and I can't help but get moved by it and so I hope it does as much for you as it has for me this message is called dream givers and I really hope you enjoy it remember that you can interact while this message is going on so I hope you do so and hope you enjoy it this message is called dream givers and I want to talk about a dynamic in our relationship with God and each other that's very, very real and very important to understand. And it, it concerns dreams. Now, it surprises some people to hear that God has a dream. And God does have a dream, and it's a very important dream. In fact, it's the entire theme of the Bible. And sometimes we get so close to the Bible that we forget what it's about. And we, we, you say, well, what's the Bible about? Well, it's about not making God mad. Well, it's about God wants your money. Well, it's about, you know, do the do's and don't do the don'ts or something like that. We, we get close to the Bible and we know certain doctrines or certain points, but we don't really understand the point of the Bible. But let me just solve the mystery right now. God wants a family. God has a dream of a family. Now, theologically speaking, it's important to understand God doesn't need anything. God is self-existent. God needs nothing outside of himself to exist. And if he did, he couldn't be God and it wouldn't be a good thing. But God is self-existent. But even though God doesn't need anything, he wants something. He wants a family. In fact, he wants a family so bad he was willing to die to get it. In John three sixteen, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The story of the Bible is very simple. God wants a family and he created Adam and Eve to produce a family for him. He commanded them to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth with a family. And God lived with them and it was God's intent to live with them forever on this earth. But they sinned, they rebelled against him. But in spite of that, from the foundation of the world, Jesus was slain because God knew they would rebel, but he had a plan of salvation to get him a family anyway. And Jesus came to pay for our sins so that we can become family members of God. And I'm saying right now, if you're a believer, you're family. If you're a believer, you're my family. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, you're my brother and sister in Christ. And listen, you're more my family than my blood family who doesn't know Jesus. And you've heard the old saying that blood is thicker than water. I believe that's true. But listen to this, spirit is thicker than blood. And the spirit bond between me and God makes me family. I am the bride of Christ and I am the son of almighty God. And I am your brother and sister. I'm your brother in Christ. You're my brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we are family and we are God's family. You are God's dream. God's dream is a family. 
And at the very end of the Bible, you know, you read a book and you're reading through a book and it's kind of a mystery, but at the end it resolves. Well, at the end of the Bible, the last two chapters in the Bible are Revelation 21 and 22. And this is the resolution of all the Bible from the book of Genesis. And I want you to listen to the family language that is used in Revelation 21 and 22 when God finally gets his dream at the end of human history. Revelation 21, one, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and they will be, uh, in, be their God and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. He said to me, right, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. And he who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he will be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the last seven plagues came and talked with me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. That's, that's all God gets. All God gets out of creation is a family. And that's what we see at the end of the Bible. It's God's dream. God, God wants a family. And he came and he created human beings to create a family for him. He doesn't need it. He just wants it very badly. But they rebelled against him, but he had a plan of redemption anyway. And so now by the blood of Jesus, we have been bought from the devil and sin into God's family. And we are God's dream. That's the Bible. That's the story of the Bible. I want to read another story. This is Mark chapter 14. This is a story about Jesus being in Bethany. Mark 14, being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask, poured it on his head, but there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they sharply criticized her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good, but me you don't, do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went to the chief priest to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might like conveniently betray him. So Jesus is in Bethany. The word Bethany means house of misery or house of depression. It's a bad place. And he's at the home of Simon the leper. And leprosy was a horrible, incurable disease that your limbs fell off and you ultimately died. And Jesus is at the home of a leper and a woman came and poured out a vial, a very costly, an alabaster flask, a very costly perfume that was one, worth one year's wage. A denarii was one day's wage for an average uh, workman in those days. And it was worth 300 denarii, so let's say $50,000. This woman came with a flask of perfume worth $50,000 and broke it and poured it out on Jesus to anoint him for burial. And when she did that, they began to complain. And wh why didn't you give that to the poor? And they began to complain. And then Jesus corrects them. And Jesus says to them, anywhere the gospel is preached in all the world, what she just did, I want you to talk about it. So literally what I'm doing right now is in obedience to the command of Jesus. I'm honoring this woman according to the command of Jesus Christ. Wherever the gospel is preached, tell what she did. Okay, that's what we're doing. And Judas, at that, got up and betrayed Jesus. That was the event that caused Judas to betray Jesus. So here's, here's some questions. Why was Jesus in such a bad place talking to a leper? I mean, why in the world would Jesus be at the house of misery talking to a leper? Okay, let me answer the question, God's dream. 
Simon the leper was God's dream. You say, yuck. He had leprosy. Well, God doesn't see people the way we see people. See, we're human beings and we have a tendency to think that healthy people are better than sick people. Or wealthy people are better than poor people. Or attractive people are better than less attractive people. God doesn't see like that because he's not shallow, he's God. When he sees us, he sees the child he made in our mother's womb. There's never a physical description of Jesus in the Bible because it doesn't matter. He's the son of God and we don't compare him to other people physically to decide if we're gonna love him or not. And God doesn't compare us to other people physically to decide if he's gonna love us or not. God loves us because we're his children and he loves Simon even though he had leprosy. Somebody say praise the Lord. That's good news. You're God's dream. You're God's dream. And you may say, Jimmy, I've done a lot of bad things. You're God's dream. Jimmy, I'm not the person I want to be. You're God's dream. You are God's dream. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what your education level is. It doesn't matter how much money you don't have in your pocket. You are God's dream. He values you. And we would say, why in the world was Jesus in Simon's house? Because he was God's dream. And God loves Simon as much as he loved everybody, and I'm thankful that my God is that way. Another question, why was the woman's gift of perfume so important that Jesus would command that she be memorialized wherever the gospel was preached? Because she didn't give perfume, she gave her dream. Women, women don't think like men. W women plan things out. And when it comes to being married, this was her dowry. She was saving this. This wasn't perfume. This was her dowry. This was her marriage. This was her children. This was her house with a white picket fence. This was her future. She had been saving. She had been planning. But she decided one day that Jesus was more important than her dream. And literally, she laid down her dream so God could have his dream. The gospel can only be preached by people who value God's dream over their dream. And that's why Jesus said, wherever this gospel is preached, you talk about what that lady did. She valued me getting my dream over her dream. And that is the spirit of the gospel. And that is the only way the gospel is gonna be preached around the world when God's dream becomes more important than our dream. And we're willing to come and give our dream to God. Literally, that's what she was doing, is giving it to God. This is what Jesus says in Mark 8. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will find it. For what will a man profit if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Let me, let me, let me change some words if I can, take a little liberty. Whoever loses his dream will find it. This is, this is what Jesus says. Whoever loses his dream for my sake and the gospels will save it. Here's another question to ask. Why did this incident provoke Judas to betray Jesus? Because Judas' dream was money and power. Judas was very put out with Jesus because he was not following the program of ascending to the throne of Israel and having power and wealth that Judas could share. And here is the proof of that. This is John chapter 12. Another story, the, the first story is Jesus' head being anointed with oil. This is now Jesus' feet being anointed with oil by Mary or perfume, John 12. Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used, it to, he used to take what was put in it. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Judas is acting like he cares about poor people. He says, I want to feed poor, you know, poor children, mine. All he cared about was himself. He didn't care about poor people. All he cared about was that money going in the treasury so he could steal it. The greatest threat to God's dream is our under surrendered dream. The greatest threat to the gospel being preached is us putting our dream in front of God's dream. And this woman 
that broke the alabaster vial of perfume was the exact opposite of Judas Iscariot. She was willing to come and lay her dream down, but Judas laid Jesus down and gave him up and sold him for 30 pieces of silver. It was the exact opposite. Dreams, greed blinds us to God's dream. Selfishness blinds us to God's dream. I wanna tell you about several dreams that, that I had to lay down in my own life. One, one related to my marriage. When I was growing up as a, as a kid, I played every sport. I'm, I've always been in athletics and I love to watch sports. I just, I'm a sports nut. I'm a cowboy nut, Dallas Cowboy nut. I'm still not over the Dez thing. And so I'm not over it. I'm, I'm getting inner healing over that. So, but when I was a kid dr growing up, I never dreamed of being a doctor or a lawyer or anything like that. I dreamed of being an athlete. Is I loved athletics and I was good in athletics and my favorite sport was baseball but I had to have surgery because of injuries from sports. And I have a big scar on my elbow here. So that kind of put me out of the baseball business. So I took up golf. So when I was in high school, I played, started playing golf and, and didn't compete in high school, but played in high school and played in college. And then Karen and I got married. But when Karen and I got married, I, I golfed all the time with my friends. I shot, you know, mid to low 70s. And I thought to myself, I had this dream within me. I was in my early 20s and I thought, you know, if I can shave three or four strokes off my score, you know, I might be able to go pro. Well, I wasn't good enough. I, I would have never made it, but still I had that dream. Well, I would come home from playing golf and Karen would meet me at the door. Uh, I'm very unhappy with me uh, because I had not been with her and the kids and I was checked out. I was either working or golfing. And when I came home, I was just zonked. And she began to complain and she was contesting me playing golf, but it was more than playing golf. It was, it was my dream. Research proves that the worst fights in marriage are on a dream level. When you're spending too much money, you're not just spending too much money, you're threatening my dream of having a secure home. When you won't come home and be with the kids, you're not just being distant, you're threatening my dream of having a, a family that loves each other and spends time together. Our worst fights are on a dream, you're messing with my dream. See, Karen had a righteous dream when we got married and Karen's dream was to have a godly family. She wanted me to be a godly husband, she wanted us to have a, a Bible-based family because neither one of us were raised in a home of, with our parents being saved. She wanted, she wanted to have a godly family with Christ in the middle of our marriage. That was her dream. My dream was golf. And one night I came in and she had been nagging about me playing golf for a long time and I came in and she was still nagging and I said, uh, get out of the house and go back to your mother and father. And I was, out, I was out of love with Karen at that point. We had fought so much, we were numb. She went in the bedroom crying and uh, that's the night the Lord broke through my heart and uh, Karen had been praying for me and we went to church every Sunday, but I was an idiot and I was a terrible <laughs> husband. I was just a very sanctified idiot. But that night I was sitting in the living room. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know, I didn't know how to keep her and I, I, didn't, know, I didn't know what to do. And um, it was like scales fell off my eyes. I don't know how to describe it. One, one minute I thought I was the perfect husband and I was married to you know, this horrible wife. And the next minute I just saw what an idiot I was, what a jerk I was. And I went in the bedroom and I apologized to Karen for the first time in our married life. And I said these words to Karen, I'm hanging my golf clubs up. But I wasn't hanging my golf clubs up, I was laying my dream down. I'll never be an athlete, I'll never, I'll never be a full-time athlete. That's been my dream since the time I was a little boy. I'll never be an athlete. I'm dying to that, okay? And I laid it down. Well, it, it healed our marriage. Me laying that down. See, my dream was a bad dream. You, you can always tell your dream's a bad dream because it's somebody else's nightmare. <laughs> Karen had a righteous dream. I had a selfish dream. And I laid my dream down. When I laid my golf clubs down, I laid my dream down. And our marriage was healed. And several years later, when our marriage was healed, I remember Karen walking up to me and saying, why don't you go play golf? And I said, excuse me, I just think I heard Jesus. <laughs> well, Karen doesn't mind me playing golf. She just minds golf coming before her. And today I have sports. I play golf. I watch sports on TV. I love, I'm just, I'm just in heaven in sports. But I serve Jesus first and I serve my wife second. And all my other dreams come way down here. So that was the first dream I had to lay down. Second, I was raised, I wasn't raised in poverty, but I was raised down the street from it. 
And uh, I worked from the time I was 10 years old. I mowed yards. I, I, I threw newspapers at four in the morning for many years. I went on Saturday morning to the donut store and filled a wagon with donuts, went door to door and sold donuts. I hauled hay, I plowed. I, you know, I worked in a car wash. And when Karen and I got married, I was working in a car wash. And so my family worked very, very hard and we didn't have any discretionary income. We just, we survived. So when Karen and I got married, I was working for my uncle at his appliance store and I was making $7,000 a year. That was my total income. I went to college, I was doing that and Karen was a stay at home mom. And we lived in government housing. Um, you had to be broke to qualify and we qualified instantly. And our, your house payment was based on your income and our house payment was $109 a month. And so it, we were, but we were just overjoyed, you know, to have a place to live. And so we went to church living in that house at that time, we went to church one Sunday and the preacher was preaching on giving. Well, I had, I had never even thought about the concept of giving money to a church, you know. So the preacher stood up and started talking about us giving 10% of our income to the church. I thought, he's crazy. I feel a lot sorry for me, more sorry for me than I do this church. I'm, there's no way, I, I was just disgusted. And I just folded my arms and I thought, I'm never coming back to this place. You know, preaching on giving, wanting my money. So we, we go home and I'm just, you know, I just kind of put it out of my mind when we get home and Karen walks up and says, I like that preacher's message. <laughs> what? And she said, Jimmy, can I give $40 to the church? I mean, I, 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 just, did, I just thought I was gonna die. I mean, I wanted money. I, I had a dream of having money in my pocket that I didn't have to pay somebody. I wanted money, I'd never had money. And I thought if you had money, all your problems went away. And I wanted money, that was one of my dreams. And when Karen walked up and said, can I get $40? We didn't have, the only way we made it was float. You know, we, we never had money at the end of two weeks. I got paid every two weeks. I mean, we, about 12 days into the two weeks, we were broke and we wrote checks that didn't land for a few days. Anybody understand float? That's the, <laughs> that's the only way we survived was by float. So Karen comes up to me and says, can I give $40 to the church? And I thought, well, I've got two answers. One, one is I say no and God strikes me dead. <laughs> and the other is I say yes and we go broke. So yes, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and live and say yes, yeah, and so. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. It just, it just freaked me out. So Karen, you know, gave $40 to the church. And I just thought, I married a fanatic and she's gonna kill us. <laughs> so she gives $40 to the church. So for two weeks, we didn't get any more money in or anything like that. Two weeks goes by and we're tr I'm trying to survive to the next paycheck. And nothing, you know, happens mysterious or anything like that. But at the end of two weeks, we had money in the bank. For the first time ever, we had money in the bank. And, and so I thought, oh, thank God we survived that. Oh, thank God, thank God. Karen walks up and says, can I give 40 more dollars? I said, oh, Karen, oh no, 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 don't, no. We survived, we survived that $40 thing that you did. But she was very sweet in a kind of an evil way. And she, can I give another $40? She's like, Karen, you wanna give again? Yes, I'd, I'd like to give again. Well, whatever you think, whatever you think. You know, so she gave again. Same thing happened again. I, I can't put a calculator to it. I can't, no big checks came in the mail. But I'm just saying something happened in our finances that even caused my hard heart to start thinking God was up to something. And then she gave again, then she gave again, then she gave again. Then I remember the first time we wrote a check that represented 10% of our income. And I thought, I'm pretty much the most spiritual man on earth. And then, <laughs> and of course then it was our giving. <laughs> we give to the Lord. So that preacher disgusted me. And he changed our family. For generations. Our children tithe off the first money they ever got in their lives. And they have given since the day they were little bitty kids, They're givers. See, we were first generation givers. It was really hard on me. Giving broke a spirit of poverty off my life and an orphan spirit off of my life. And I know God because of giving. Sometimes when I preach on giving, it makes people mad. I understand that. Totally understand it, but I'm your best friend. And generations from now, 
your life will be different if you give to the Lord. I laid down my dream of having money and God has blessed us in ways that are unbelievable. About 15 years ago, I was preaching in Amarillo and we were building a church and raising money to build the church and I, I preached a message and asked people to go home and pray and bring their gift back for the building, the special building offering. And um, Karen and I had a dream of building a home. We, we've always just wanted to build a home that we, you know, like we wanted it. And um, so we were saving for that purpose and so I got up and preached a message on giving to the building fund. So Karen and I went home and we always are the first to give in any offering that we take. And so we went home and prayed and um, we'd given many times, you know, in all different offerings and love to give. I mean, we absolutely love to give to the Lord. And so as I was praying one morning, I said, Lord, how much do you want us to give to this offering? Lord said, give everything. And I was thinking about, you know, our dream of a home and, um, and I knew it was the Lord. Well, I mean, I, knew, I know the voice of the Lord. I knew the Lord was saying me give everything. So Karen was praying too, and she came in one day and, and she said, well, what, how much are we gonna give this offering this weekend? I said, well, what, what did the Lord say to you? And uh, you, know, you know how that goes. And she said, no, what did the Lord say to you? I said, what did the Lord say to you, Karen? She said, no, what did the Lord say to you? I said, Karen, this may not be the Lord. But the Lord said, give everything. Karen said, that's what he said to me. So we didn't sell our houses or our cars, but we took stock savings and all the money in our checking account. And we wrote out a check that represented all of that. And that next weekend, we walked down the middle aisle of our church. We had containers down at the front. We were taking our offering. We put that check there. And it was a kind of a scary, thrilling thing, you know. And um, we didn't have, but we gave everything we had to the Lord. It was just right there in that offering container. And we went home and, you know, I got paid the next time and we, we didn't starve. We didn't go without food or anything like that. But we just had this experience of giving that to the Lord and laying our dream down of a new home. So a couple of months later, Karen's parents called us and they said, hey, we've been thinking about, you know, planning for the future and, you know, we don't want to wait until we die to bless our kids. So if y'all will build a house, we'll pay for it. And we did. <laughs> and we were not easy on them. <laughs> we live in our dream home. It's paid for. If you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. And I'm not promising you that everything will go a lot perfect in your life and there's a slot machine that you pull the lever and everything happens perfect. I am promising you, if you lay down your dream for Jesus, that you'll get the dream that you're wanting. I'm telling you, if you'll put God's dream in front of your dream, that you'll find your dream. And if there's something wrong with your dream, it's just gonna die so that it doesn't ruin anything in your life, your marriage or anything else in your life. But if your dream is a righteous dream, the dream of a future, the dream of a ministry, the dream of a family, the dream of something good, when you lay down your dream, Jesus said, wherever the gospel is preached in all the world, you talk about this. And that's what I'm doing right now. That woman became famous by laying her dream down for God's dream. What's your alabaster vial? What's your dream? Let me give you some questions as we close. Do you have an unsurrendered dream in your life that is keeping you from serving the Lord or giving obediently? That's an important question. Is your dream coming before God's dream? Here's another important question. Do you have an unsurrendered dream that is causing problems in your marriage or family? like my sports, maybe it's your business, maybe it's you know, something else. But your dream is coming before your marriage and your spouse resents it and it's causing you problems. And here's the last question, is your life self-centered or God-centered? Judas's life was self-centered. 
He was willing to steal from Jesus to get what he wanted. But the woman who came and poured out her alabaster flask, she had a Christ-centered life. I want you to bow your heads with me if you would. In fact, if you would go ahead and stand with me. And I want our musicians to come and our altar ministers to come if they would. And I'm gonna pray a prayer here. And as soon as I pray this prayer, you'll be able to come down if you wanna receive ministry here at the front. We're gonna have one more song of worship before we go. And this is an important time of ministry. I want you to bow your heads if you would. I don't want anybody looking around, just just to create privacy, please. But I, I I want to ask you, how many of you would say, Jesus Christ is Lord of my life? I want you just to raise your hand. Say, Jesus is Lord of my life. I want you to raise your hand. Okay. I see just, I think every hand just went up. Go ahead and put your hands down if you would. Let me ask you another question. And you don't, you don't have to raise your hand because nobody's looking around. Okay. How many of you would say, today, right now, I lay down every dream in my life for the sake of the gospel. Raise your hand if you would say that. I lay down my dream for the sake of the gospel. It doesn't mean that you never have what you have right now. It just means it's less important than God's dream. I want you to put your hands down if you would. One one more question. And thank you for everybody. Just raise your hand because tons of hands just went up. How many of you would say that there's a dream in your life that's hurting your marriage or another very important relationship. And again, it may be sports like me or money or something. And what you're saying is right now, I'm laying that dream down. That dream is not a good dream. And I'm laying it down for the sake of my family and my marriage. Raise your hand if you would right now, if that's you. Just nobody looking around. Raise your hand. A lot of hands are going up. Father, in the name of Jesus, we can't change the story of human history. We're a part of it, but we can't change it. And the story is you want a family. And God, we're your family, we're your dream. And we think we are so thankful that you love us so much that you were willing to pay such an incredible price for our souls. We are so proud of you. We're so thankful for you that you came from heaven down to earth to redeem us, to be your family, your sons and daughters, your bride. And that's who we are, and we're so thankful. But God, there's so many people in the world today that don't know the gospel. They've never heard the gospel. They don't know Jesus. And what we're saying is this. We want to make your dream come true. We want the gospel to be preached around the world so that your family can grow, so that in heaven we can have billions of brothers and sisters in Christ that are a part of your family. God, from this day forward, what we say is your dream is the most important dream in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, that message really gets me every single time. And I know some of you were making that declaration yourself just now, that you wanna exchange your your dream for God's dream. And you wanna put God's dream first. And you wanna be able to to put yourself first and, and break open your alabaster jar and, and lay that dream down so that God's dream can be evident in your life and that we can grow God's kingdom and see many people come unto salvation. Uh, I'm just so grateful for this opportunity that we have to come together like this. And if you need anything from us, go ahead and just leave a comment. Don't forget to like, comment, and share this message to help get the word out. But most importantly, if you need anything from us, we love being able to interact with you online during this season and i just love you so much and let me pray for you before we go father bless these people in jesus name i pray that your blessing and your dream would be in our hearts and be at the forefront of our thoughts I pray anybody struggling with health or financial issues um, that you would show up in a mighty way in their life pray these things in jesus name god bless we love you God bless you, and we will see you again very soon.